Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. Hey guys, Kevin Cruz here. Welcome to the LeadX Leadership Show, where we help you to stand out and to get ahead at work. Now, as you know, we like to switch things up here, keep it interesting, and to continue that tradition, today on the podcast, instead of me interviewing an expert guest, we're going to have the guest deep dive into their topic. You see, you'll be hearing audio from a LeadX webinar. Now, of course, there are dozens of great webinars on leadership, management, communication, productivity, and more, all archived in the LeadX app. Just visit leadx.org for more information about our webinar archive. So enough on the setup, enough background information. Enjoy. Hi, welcome to Hiring for Retention, an overview of behavioral-based interviewing. My name is Chris Casarino, and I am the founder of Starling North, LLC. I'll be taking you through the program today. So what are our objectives? The first objective is we're going to discuss what is the impact of a poor hiring process? What is the impact on your organization in many different facets? What is the impact of maybe not even having a process? I've worked with uh, many organizations that either don't have a process at all or more commonly have an inconsistent process dis distributed throughout the organization. So one department will um, have their own procedures and then another department will have their own based on what they believe the best way to source talent is. And we're gonna look at some of the different ways that that can impact your organization. Next, we're gonna introduce hiring for retention. And hiring for retention is a behavioral-based interview process that both looks at how do you evaluate a candidate's skill or ability? How do you evaluate a candidate's preferences or affinity? Making sure that the candidate is truly the right fit not only for your organization, but also for the role that they're interviewing for. We want to make sure that when we bring somebody into the organization, they're going to be a good fit so that they stay and are productive in the organization. Next, we're going to talk about how do you assess your data? You're done interviewing this candidate. You've got a ton of notes on the things they've said. You have some notes on things that you've observed. But what do you do with that? You know, it's funny, I've observed a lot of interviews uh, from leaders and they'll go through this whole process of asking behavioral based questions and doing a, a proper resume review. And then the debrief discussion goes to, oh, I really liked them or I really liked her. Or, I did not feel that she was a good fit. The problem with that is you've taken all that objective data and gone to a subjective decision. And that's what we call hiring on our gut. And then last but not least, we're going to go over some of the best practices that I've observed in my career. You know, things to think about to really truly make sure that you're successful in an interview and practices. So let's jump into our course. The first part we're going to talk about is the impact of poor hiring. So some statistics for you. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, if you make a poor hiring decision, it can cost your organization as much as 30% of that employee's first year salary. 30%, it's a staggering number when you think about it, especially if you multiply that if you're making numerous bad hires. Next, it could also, according to the undercover recruiter, it can actually cost your company up to $240,000 per candidate. And now that's not um, <clears throat> just about the loss of salary. It's, it's the loss of productivity. So if you have an open rec because it takes you eight, 12 weeks to hire somebody as a replacement, but also onboarding, you get somebody into the role as a, you know, because you've lost an employee, how long is it going to take you to ramp that individual up? What is the impact on your brand? You know, did that person leave um, and, and disparage your organization or did you potentially have a negative candidate experience and that has a negative impact to your brand? We'll look at some uh, statistics about that as well. And last but not least, it also takes into context legal fees. There is certainly the possibility of legal recourse whenever you separate an employee. So as you can see, it's really important that we make effective hiring decisions. So why do bad hiring decisions happen? Well, there's many, many things that come into play here, 
But a couple of stats from career builders first, and this is, I've heard this time and time again, 43% of respondents in a career builder survey said, we needed to hire someone quickly. We were impatient. We wanted to get the role filled. I know many of you out there have been in that place before either you uh, have a sales role that without somebody in there generating the sales, you're losing revenue. Or perhaps you're fearful that you're going to lose that open requisition because you haven't filled it. Well, 43% said that they needed to hire someone quickly. Also in that same survey, one in five people surveyed said they lacked the skill to interview effectively. That is 22% of individuals said that they did not have the proper skills to interview effectively. Uh, again, I've seen a lot of interviews. I've sat in and, and shadowed and observed leaders. And I can tell you, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of people that are going on their gut and using tactics that perhaps worked or, or you thought worked 20 years ago. So that's why we're talking about hiring for retention. It takes some of that subjectivity and makes it an objective process that actually is proven to be, to be effective in sourcing talent. Another thing to think about is the candidate experience. How many of you out there have gone on an interview and you've left and you said, oh, that didn't really, I didn't really enjoy that. Or I don't know if I could work for that person. Or I don't know if I, if how I did, because I never heard back from the recruiter. I never heard back from the hiring manager. I never heard anything. I think the stat is something like 80% or, or 75% of, of uh, individuals that don't get any feedback after an interview. Well, if your candidate has a bad experience in this process, there is a severe impact on your organization. If they've had a bad candidate experience, according to Career Arc and Software Advice, 63% will actually reject an offer. I remember I interviewed with an organization many, many, many years ago after coming off uh, a couple of really strong sales years. And the candidate experience I had with this interview process was so poor that when offered the job, I, I rejected the offer. And then years later, I was offered another job with that organization. And, and the, the experience over eight years prior was still in my mind and still had impacted me that I could not take the job. So it certainly has the possible repercussions of losing out on very strong talent. Now, with social media and the internet, people talk. And actually 72% of candidates are likely to tell others about their bad experience. You know, we have the, the website Glassdoor. You can go on there and read reviews. You can see ratings of organizations. So Everything you do from start to finish with a candidate is going to have an impact on your ability to source talent, but it also has an impact on your sales, really. 64% uh, of candidates said, I'm less likely to buy goods or services from that company that left me with a bad experience. So there, again, it's really important that regardless of whether or not we decide to bring that candidate into the organization, we want to make sure that they have a positive experience. They feel that they were treated fairly and they maintain, their dignity was maintained. And why is hiring for retention so important? This, <laughs> this statistic is probably one of the most staggering. According to a survey by Leadership IQ, 46% of employees fail within the first 18 months. 46%. So half the time, we're not getting this right. Half the time, we're making mistakes. So that's why it's really important that we bring a process in that is proven, that truly evaluates not only in a candidate's ability, but also their affinity for the organization and the role they're interviewing for. So now that we talked about really some of the importance of why we need to do this, why we need a process, why we need consistency. Let's introduce hiring for retention. So let's play a game. We're going to play a game called legal or not. Okay. We're going to look at some common questions that you probably have asked and are they legal? Are they not legal? And what's a better way of asking or what's a better alternative if there is one? 
Because a lot of times, you know, you, you greet the candidate, you haven't sat down for the official interview. Sometimes you're walking to the interview room and just making very small talk, chit chat. And this could get you into some uh, legal hot water, if you will. Are you married or do you have any children? Uh, I was consulting for an organization years ago that was sued for asking this very question when the candidate did not receive the job. Um, the, the, can, uh, the interviewer didn't mean anything by it. it, was just trying to make small talk. But when the candidate shared that, yeah, actually I have four children, five children, and they didn't get the job, they felt that this might have been a disqualifying factor. This is something that you should never, never discuss with a candidate. You want to keep your interview focused on the questions that are in the interview guide and any preference questions that we'll talk about later. Um, you, can add, you can say hello to the candidate, welcome them, thank them for coming, ask them how their drive was, but you really want to avoid that personal question there. Where do you live? Another question that you do not want to ask in an interview and could certainly get you into some legal trouble because this discloses perhaps their socioeconomic class or um, any other uh, bias that might exist. So you, you want to steer away from that. I know some people do ask this question because they're concerned with, you know, can they reliably get to and from this job each day? Well, that's a better way of asking it. You know, do you have reliable transportation and the means to make it to this office on these set hours uh, that are expected? Or do you have any issues that would arise of being at work from nine to five in this office, uh, which is a requirement? But, but asking where do you live is not a question you should ask. As a follow-up, another common one is, do you have a car? Well, you would think that, well, that's a common question you should ask. So you want to know that this individual has the ability to drive to the office that is in, case, in, in the event that you're in like a suburban or rural area. Maybe if you're in like a city, you might not even, that might even concern you at public transportation. But regardless, this is a question you cannot legally ask a candidate. You can ask a candidate, do you have reliable transportation? Do you have a reliable means of getting to the office? But you cannot ask a candidate if they have a car. Next, I see you went to XXX or whatever university, it could be any university. You could even gone to the same university as the candidate. What, what year did you graduate? Even if it's just general curiosity, there's a big reason why you can't ask that. That is disclosing a candidate's age and potentially a protected class. You should never ask when they graduated, when they attended a school, or even if they're in the armed forces, when they were discharged. You just want to stay away from that. You can ask them, what did you study specifically in school or, or what did you learn at university that is applicable? But you cannot ask, what year did you graduate? And sadly, this, some of you are listening in on this saying, well, this all seems very commonplace. These questions are up here because these are questions I've observed that uh, interviewers have absolutely asked. I noticed your accent. Where are you from originally? Um, again, probably say, well, that makes sense. Why would you ask that? But sometimes you're just having a normal conversation. Maybe the candidate has a really nice accent. You're interested. You're trying to figure out, is it from this country or not? But the problem is, again, you cannot ask that. So you just want to steer away. These are some of the questions that can get you in some legal trouble. Again, you may not have, or your people may not have any ill intent when asking these questions. It could be just a matter of small talk, but I wanted to highlight these uh, and why it is really important, because what I've observed is when there's not a consistent process in place, we tend to defer to small talk. And when we get, tend to defer to small talk, these questions will surface and many others. So that's why it is really crucial that we have a consistent process in place. So what are the components for hiring for retention? Well, we wanna really look at two major factors. One, like I've talked about earlier, is abilities. Does this individual have the skills or the competence, another way of saying it, to do the role? What are the skills that are required to be successful in this role? Next is, does the associate have the affinity or the preference for the different um, characteristics of the role? So if we're talking about a customer service role, does this individual 
have an affinity for talking to customers? Do they enjoy it? Um, think about your leadership style. Like if you tend to be a very hands-on involved leader, do they enjoy that? I remember um, years ago, I was consulting for a senior leader at an organization and uh, this individual said, well, I'm losing a lot of people within the first week. I, I, they're going to another company and, and I can't figure out why they are. And, and sadly, they thought it was associated with this individual's, these individuals were millennials. And I said, well, what's your hiring process? Because this is an office-based environment. Are you asking questions that will tease out whether or not this individual wants to work in an office? Because you're losing a lot of your employees to work from home uh, roles. And it was almost like the light bulb went off because they didn't think about that, that they weren't sourcing in that interview process that associates for the role would rather, uh, would rather, excuse me, work in an office versus work from home. So it's really important that we not only look at the skills required, but will this person be a good fit for not only the organization, but also my leadership style, the role, uh, and different other variability, uh, variables that come with the, the position. So let's look at where we're gonna, uh, how we're gonna interview. The first step is prepare. And this is something that's often overlooked and it's usually due to, you know, whether it's your recruiter or the way you scheduled it, you usually have meeting and then your interview. And I've seen it time and time again with my own eyes where you see a leader running uh, from one meeting and then is ruffling through a resume as they run to an interview. So it's really important. We're going to highlight some of the things that are important uh, during the preparation phase to make sure that you're really prepared to have an effective interview. Next, we'll talk about all the different pieces of how to conduct an interview effectively. How do you, assess, how do you um, interview for both ability and affinity effectively. And then last but not least, like I shared earlier, is how do you make sure that all that data is looked at from an objective uh, fashion so that you can make the best decision for your organization on whether or not to bring this candidate in? So let's talk about preparation. The first thing that you wanna do is review the resume. And I know that sounds silly, but um, in my consulting, I've seen many, many times that Candidates will say, I, I didn't have time to read the resume. I'll do it really quickly on the way in. And what ends up happening is too many times ago, walk me through your resume. I remember I was sitting in on an interview many years ago and the same thing had happened. Uh, I was the, the gentleman I was working for said, hey, we're going to do an interview really quick before we go to this next meeting. Uh, candidate will be here in 15 minutes. Uh, let's run. And we, we ran in there, didn't have time to look over the resume. And the first thing he said was, walk us through your resume. And I remember looking at my clock and it was 17 minutes later that the candidate stopped speaking about their resume. And we both had zoned out. And I remember thinking like that was not the best use of our time or the candidate's time. So it's important that we review as an interviewer, review the resume first so that we can highlight and zone in on the areas that we have questions about or we need more clarification. So we go through the resume and say, what questions do I have about the roles? What questions do I have about the career changes? What questions do I have about their skills or, or, or their work experience, their education? Um, but make sure you get those out because the last thing you wanna do is go cover to cover with the resume. You know, and typically I've seen many interviews, usually 60 minutes, and if you're using this process, the majority of your interview should not be on the resume. It should be on asking those both behavioral uh, or ability questions and fit questions or affinity. Plan your questions, plan your affinity fit questions. We'll, we'll highlight some of some best practice of questions you can ask, but really you want to plan those before you get to the interview. Asking questions about things that they like and dislike to make sure that you know, they're going to be a fit. But aside from just that, you know, planning your questions, have a really good idea of what you're looking for. If you know that that position that you're hiring for is a field-based position, there's going to be a lot of autonomy. There's going to potentially be a lot of alone time. 
So what questions could I, you know, ask to assess whether or not that's an ideal work environment for my employ- uh, for the candidate? What questions, what answers might I look for to make sure that that's an ideal work environment? On the flip side, if we know that this is a position that requires a candidate to be in an office from nine to five or different hours, what questions can I ask to assess that if this is really what the candidate would, the the environment that the candidate would thrive in and what answers would I look for? If a candidate is really looking for a job, they're going to tell you what you want to hear. So you want to be cautious of not giving away too much information when you ask these questions. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on in the program of how do we not lead the candidate? Next, plan your resume questions. Um, A lot of times you're part of a hiring team. You may or may not be the only person interviewing for the role. Um, So you wanna make sure that if, if your company has three, four, five competencies or skills that you're looking to assess, what questions are you gonna ask for each competency? Sometimes uh, a best practice is to have certain interviewers take uh, two competencies, three competencies for sake of time, and then have some overlap on the most important ones, but then have difference so that the interview is not the same from uh, interviewer to interviewer. So plan what questions that you want to ask for each competency and practice those questions because a lot of times they're, they're written in an interview guide and they may not be your words of choice. So sometimes it's a best practice to take those questions and verbalize them, verbalize them and see, you know, does that flow when I say it, or does it sound like I'm reading from an interview guide, put it into your own words. So it sounds natural. Make sure that you're comfortable with the questions that you're going to ask, determine them, you know, determine, say, you know, and this is important. If you're just a sole interviewer, probably not as important uh, as though when you're on an interview team, but if there's, if myself and two other people are interviewing, I want to differ, I want to make sure that we divide up the questions for each competency so that we're getting enough um, different questions under each skill to get the right data, the good amount of data. So if I'm interviewing with another person, I'll say, hey, I'm going to look at this uh, competency of uh, driving for results. And here's the five questions that we have in our interview guide. I'm going to take these two, you take these two. Or maybe we'll overlap on one to see if we get a different answer. But take the time before you get into the interview to decide. Because there's nothing like fumbling through your interview guide and you got five questions in front of you and you're like, I'll ask this one. And then you realize that that question was almost the same question as the one you just asked, which is not always a bad thing. But taking the time to decide what questions you want to ask will make sure you get the data that you need to make a sound decision. This is an interesting and very controversial um, point, and many people don't uh, realize it, but when I ask people, I say, well, how long should you spend when you talk about the resume with a candidate? They say like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, some say 10. Very few people that I ask this question to will say five minutes. So why would you only spend five minutes on a candidate's resume? Well, there's many reasons. Uh, Number one, it's been shown that candidates can potentially exaggerate their resume. They also, it's just, it's just a document of words. Um, it, it's not necessarily going to tell you everything you need to know. Where they went to school is, is, is good. It's a qualifying factor. Where they worked, qualifying factor. But the most important things that will tell you, and, and there, there's, there's, a, there's a saying that says, you know, past behavior predicts future behavior. Well, what somebody typically does in a role, they're going to bring to a future role. So <clears throat> you can get all that information out when you're looking uh, for their ability and their affinity through interviewing questions. The resume review should only be used for assessing uh, affinity as well as clearing up any questions you might have. So some things you might look for. You might look for um, gaps in the resume. You want, might want to get clarity. You might want to understand why they left an organization, why, what, they, what they liked about an organization. That goal goes to affinity and clearing up any potential um, questions you have. But you really don't want to spend the lion's share of your interview on this document. You want to move really quickly through this and get into the meat of the interview. So let's talk about 
opening the interview because that is really the way you set the stage effectively for the way the rest of it's going to go. The first thing is building rapport. We know that candidates are typically nervous and a nervous candidate is often not going to give you the best representation of themselves. It goes to candidate experience first. You want to make sure that no matter what, this candidate has a good experience because even if they don't get the job, they're going to say, hey, I was treated fairly. It just wasn't a fit or maybe I, was, I, I wasn't ready. Who knows? They'll say a number of things, but rest assured, if, if you don't pay, take time, build rapport and they feel like, you know, I, they were cold or they were standoffish or um, they were um, trying to intimidate, which <laughs> sounds crazy, but that was an old school thinking of interviewing. And I've observed that in many organizations where, well, I want to, I want to see if they can think on their feet. I want to see how they handle the intimidation. Well, as we know, a candid experience, chances are that person is going to go to the internet and tell you how they felt, which is not going to be good for your organization. So tight, take time to build rapport, help the candidate feel comfortable. They also are more likely to open up. So some ways you can build rapport. First, thank them for coming. Uh, acknowledge as you read their resume. Say, hey, I, I read your resume. I was looking at uh, when you worked at um, this organization and I noticed you had won this award. That's really impressive. I'd love to hear more about it. Um, you got some great qualifications and I'm looking forward to having this discussion. You're making the candidate feel as though their time is just as valuable as yours. What do you got to lose by doing that? I mean, even if you if this candidate's not the right fit for your, your role, it's possible, and I've seen this before, that they're a better fit for a different role in your organization. You might end up referring them to a colleague. And if they're not a fit today, maybe they're a fit tomorrow. So who knows? But there's, it doesn't hurt you to take the time to build rapport. Lay out an agenda. Let them know what to expect. Now, you got to be careful what you say here because <clears throat> tell them the process. Say, you know, I'm going to you know, take a few moments, uh, go through your resume. I've got a few questions about that. Then I'm going to transition into um, our interview. And I'm going to ask you some more questions about some specific examples. Then we'll close out the interview. I'll give you an um, uh, opportunity to ask questions of me about the role, about myself and the organization. Um, one thing I do caution, though, is don't give a specific time of how long the interview is going to take. You know, some people like to say, all right, so we have about 60 minutes together or 45 minutes or whatever it might be. What happens when <laughs> you realize within 30 minutes that this is not a good fit? Some people even said, I knew in the first 10 minutes it wasn't a good fit. Now, I would, uh, I'll give you some, some tips at the end of best practice of how, how long you should keep an interview. But the last thing you want to do, regardless of how long that interview lasts, is give a time commitment. Because if you tell them we're going to have 60 minutes together and you take 30 minutes for the interview, what's the candidate thinking? The candidate is wondering what they did wrong or, or why you cut them short or it all goes to candidate experience. You want to set the right expectations. Don't overpromise. Don't underpromise. Just lay out the agenda. Also set expectations for a few other things. First, star. Uh, we're going to talk more about this. This is, this is the process for behavioral based interviewing, which has been around a long time. Um, it's really the crux of, of hiring for retention is the way you source a person's ability. Star, tell them when I'm done with the resume review, I'm going to ask you some questions that are going to be looking for specific uh, work examples, times that, you know, you've done things and I'm going to be looking for specifics. The way I'd like you to answer is in this format. What was the situation or task involved? So um, what was the situation of that, that specific scenario or what was a task you were working on in that time? Um, what were the actions that you took? What did you specifically do in that situation? And then last but not least, what was the result of those actions? Tell them early, tell them now, that's how you want them to answer because otherwise you're gonna find yourself telling the candidate, hey, can you give me a specific example? Can you tell me more about what you did or what was the result of that? You waste precious interview time backtracking if you don't set the stage early. I remember one leader said to me, well, wouldn't the best candidates 
just know to answer that way. That's a, that's an assumption you're taking that, that they may have had a behavioral based interview process. And I'm, from my experience, not organizations have adopted this process, so they may not know. So what is it, what's the harm in, in setting expectations early? Because, you know, if a candidate doesn't have the stories, you'll see it. But if they do, why not give them the best opportunity for success? Next, set the expectation that at times you may look down and take notes. Um, typically speaking, if you don't set that expectation, what do you think happens? If I'm talking to you and you look down and take, start taking notes, chances are you're going to stop talking or I'm going to stop talking. So say, hey, listen, at times throughout the interview, I'm going to look, I'm going to be taking notes. Um, it's just me recording some of the key points of things you said, um, just really so that when I go back after this interview, I have uh, ensured that I'll remember the things that you said, the responses to your questions. So please, by no means, don't stop talking. I'm still listening. Uh, and, you know, don't worry. This is customary. I'm going to take a lot of notes. It typically puts the candidate at ease because the other thing they're wondering is either they're wondering if you're listening. The other thing they're going, well, what is this? What are they, what are they writing? What are they writing? So then sometimes you'll actually see the candidate like looking over like this, like trying to figure out what's on the paper. So if you just tell them, hey, I'm writing your responses so that I can go and remember them after the fact. Um, last but not least, it's not on the slide here, but I think it should be worth highlighting is because you only have so much time together, make sure that you tell them, I might have to interrupt you at times throughout the interview. And it's, it's not trying to be rude or anything. It's because I may have the information I need on that answer, or you may have said something that I really want to dig in and learn more about. So please don't be alarmed if I interrupt you or I ask to move on. It's just because I, I want to make sure that I make the best use of our time together so that I get the information that I need to make a, a, a good decision and you make, uh, you receive the right information because I want to make sure you have ample time to get the information you need because ultimately this is a mutual decision. So you've opened the interview effectively. Now it's time to get into it. Like I shared earlier, you're going to do your resume review for five minutes. You're going to do give or take. You're going to really go through your quick planned questions. Um, anything that you need cleared up about the resume. Is there a question you have about why they have a gap here? Is there something that you don't know about this one, one role they had? It wasn't descriptive enough. Or perhaps um, do you want to know why they left an organization or why they're looking today? It should be no more than five minutes. Or do you need clarification on where they went to school, why they went to, what they learned in school, or whatever it might be. But the key is it should be only about five minutes. Then you're going to move into um, your first stage of like affinity questions, fit questions, things that they like or dislike about certain things, about past roles they've had, past leaders they've had. Because you're trying to assess, is this an organization? Is this a role? Is this a culture that this candidate is going to thrive in? And then you transition into your behavioral questions to assess a candidate's ability. That's where we're going to really find out is, does this candidate have the skills to do the job effectively? And then throughout follow-up questions. Follow-up questions are going to be used any time that you look back and you go, they didn't finish answering that question. I didn't get a result out of that star. Or the result I got wasn't exactly what I was looking for. I want more information. So you'll go through and make sure that you've got all the data that you want. Because once the candidate leaves, your, your ability to retain all the information is not going to happen. You're going to forget a lot of things the candidate said. Because chances are you're either moving to another interview. You're running to another meeting. Maybe you're having going to lunch. The first thing that happens is you, you, you forget half of it. And what do you do when you forget half of it? You go to fit. Uh, you go to uh, hiring on gut. You start saying, huh, well, I, I liked it. I liked that person or I got a good feeling. Now you just wasted everything that you did. All that hard work on affinity and ability goes out the window. So you want to make sure that you get all your follow-up questions that your, so your data is, is good so that you can do um, and evaluate it after the fact. So affinity. Like I said, this is really the candidate's preferences. Um, what are the, some of the things you want to look for? 
think about your own leadership style. What is your style of leadership? Do you tend to be more collaborative? Do you tend to be more hands-on, more high involvement? I want, hopefully not micromanaging, but you know, for example, I've, I've seen, I've worked in roles. Uh, when I was in a field sales role, I worked with my boss maybe once every three weeks and we talked on the phone once or twice a week. That's a low involvement uh, leader. So what am I gonna, if I was sourcing for that position, I'm gonna look for somebody that has a high affinity for autonomy, right? Somebody that really uh, thrives in an environment where they have a lot of autonomy is what I'm looking for. Now, again, if I'm talking about a sales position, regardless, if this person can sell, great. But if they don't like a lot of autonomy because they like to be in a team environment, like, like a team sell, they want their boss to help them out on big deals on a consistent basis, it's not gonna be a good fit. Um, on, uh, on the flip side, what about the culture? Like what, what are some aspects of the culture? Like, is it a very competitive culture? Um, does this person like a lot of competition? Is it a very team oriented uh, culture? These are the things that you want to think about. Uh, the role, uh, what else about the role? So if it's a, if it's a customer service role, um, is there certain customers that this, this person likes to work for or work with? So do they like working with like enterprise level customers or do they enjoy working with small businesses? You know, it sounds crazy because you're like, well, if it's a customer service, customer service is customer service. Sales is sales. Not necessarily true. If you ask a salesperson, you know, what they enjoy, some salespeople love the quick, uh, quick, uh, small deals that they can get a lot of business in a day, like very quick transactional because it's, it's all those wins where some people like the more strategic nature of like a large enterprise uh, process that could take three, six, 12 months. So you're really looking for this individual preferences. My example I used earlier, hiring these individuals that want to work from home for an office-based position. Well, that's not going to be the best fit for that organization. That was a, a again, a, I think it was a, a sales position and they could sell but when, when given the choice in an office or at home, they wanted to work from home. So all that onboarding and it was a waste because it was the candidate didn't have an affinity for the position. So what are some questions you can ask? What's your best job? What was your best job? What did you like about it? What did you dislike about it? That's going to be a great question. You're going to hear like things like, I really loved the fast paced nature, or I really loved the, the way we were compensated, or I really loved um, the culture. I loved how inclusive the culture was. I didn't like the fact that I worked on a team because I really felt like a lot of my successes were shared with others. Just some examples of things you're gonna hear. What was your least favorite job? what did you dislike about it? Was there anything you liked? So now you're going to be here. Yeah, I didn't like uh, this job because very rigid hours. I had to be in the office at eight, out of the office at six. We know with some of the younger generation, Gen Y and Gen Z, um, and again, these are just generalities. It changes from person to person, but we do know that there is um, some some generality that the, the the younger workforce really loves the flexibility, being judged for work output instead of work time put in. So, you know, thinking about, you know, what they like and dislike is going to help you stay abreast with whether or not this person's a fit. Um, they could also say, you know, I didn't like, uh, I didn't like the product I was selling. I didn't like the customers. Um, I enjoyed doing X, but I didn't like how it was being done. Or maybe I didn't like the culture. Um, describe your best supervisor and what you like or, and dislike about them. Again, this goes back to like, Knowing yourself as a leader, if you're going to manage this person, know who you are as a leader, know your leadership voice, know how you tend to interact with people, and then see if that's a fit. If you know that you tend to be more hands-off and you're hiring somebody that wants more hands-on approach, you're both going to be frustrated by that interaction. So again, you're looking for this individual's preferences. Describe your ideal work environment. 
And please share any examples of when you worked in a job like this. Again, you're looking for way, uh, you know, environments in which this person has, has thrived, you know, places that uh, and situations that this individual really enjoyed and seeing is, is this a fit for the role and the organization? You know, of all the, the coaching and training I've done in this area of interviewing, this is the one area that many leaders uh, forget to conduct in the interview. They're so hyper-focused on those behavioral-based questions that they forget to spend time looking and, and listening for affinity, things that the associate would like. You can do that before um, you get into behavioral-based interviewing. You can do that at the end, you can do that during the resume review. So those questions stand alone. You can also ask follow-up questions after behavioral question that'll help you source this data. So if you ask somebody a behavioral question about um, customer service or planning and organizing, you can follow up and say, well, that's a great example. What was most satisfying about that? What did you really enjoy about that situation? What did you find most frustrating about that situation? What did you not like? What did you enjoy most? Why? You know, if you're asking somebody that just solved a complex customer problem, you want to know why they enjoyed it. What did they take out of it? Again, you're looking for affinity, but also looking for intrinsic motivation. If you could say, if you ask one person, like, hey, what'd you like about that? Like, I get enjoyment of solving difficult problems. It, it really, it's part of the reason why I come to work every day. Or somebody else says, I closed a big deal. I made a lot of money. You're, tell, you're learning a lot about the candidate's intrinsic motivation. You know, things that they really are driven by. How did that make you feel? That sounds a little touchy-feely, but you're really trying to elicit, like, what they enjoyed or did not enjoy. How did you feel after that deal? Or how did you feel after that, after you got through that time crunch? Like, how did you feel after it? So these are just some ways that you can continue to source affinity from a candidate. Okay. So now you've gotten a good handle on how a candidate um, prefers, what they prefer about a, a work environment, what they prefer about a role what they were looking for from a leader like yourself. Now it's time to transition into, can they do the job? Do they have the ability? Do they have the skills required to be successful in this role? But let's start first on some questions that you want to avoid, and that's leading. Um, you want to avoid leading questions because typically speaking, the interview is, a, it's almost like a sales process. You, they're trying to sell you on why they are the best fit for this role. So the last thing you want to do is tell them what you're looking for in an answer. This job requires you to make two customer visits per day. How do you feel about that? What do you think the candidate's going to say? Most likely the candidate's going to say, sounds good. I'm all in. So you don't want to lead the, cost, uh, the client, um, sorry, candidate. You don't want to lead them with the information that you're looking for. Um, that's why we stick to our behavioral questions. But a better way to ask this would say, in your, if you're looking for affinity or, or, or what they've done, say, hey, what was a typical day for you in your last role? You can ask that, because you're not giving the, the indication of like what the number that they're, you're looking for. In this role, you'll need to work on multiple projects at the same time. How comfortable are you with this? Again, chances are the, customer, the, the uh, candidate's going to say, I'm, I'm very comfortable. I, I can handle that anytime. I can handle multiple projects. I do great. I'm a multitasker. A better way to answer, ask that is to use a behavioral question of times that they have done that, times that they've handled big workloads under time constraints. So again, you want to avoid the, the um, leading questions because they're essentially giving your candidate the answers you're looking for. Hypothetical questions. You, you're going to laugh at some of these, but I've heard and seen these done in interviews. And then when I've asked them, what were you looking for? Everybody has an answer. But if I asked you, if you were an animal, which one would you be? And I had a, a leader that did ask that question. And I said, well, what are you looking for? And they said, well, 
I'm looking for a ferocious, aggressive, because this is a, um, uh, you know, a position that requires a lot of initiative. Okay. That's a pretty subjective way of looking at it. And I'm not really sure if that's going to get you the data you're looking for. If you were an animal, which one would you be? What if, what if um, I'm interviewing for a sales position and I want to be a bird? Is that not aggressive enough? It's too subjective. I want to be a bird because I like to fly. Or maybe I want to be a fish or a dolphin because I love to surf. That's a little bit, you know, that could be it. Doesn't mean I had a successful sales career, but I'm not going to, I don't want to be a lion or a tiger. So it's way too subjective. It brings us right back to where we're hiring on our gut. If you won the lottery, what would you do? And this is another real question. These, I'm not making these up. I had, uh, I was consulting on an interview guide and this question popped up and I asked them, I said, well, what, what exactly are you looking for there? And this was the answer I received. I'm looking for somebody that even if they win the lottery, they're coming to work the next day. And I said, um, hmm, okay, do you think I'm lazy? And the leader said, well, no, I think you work very hard. And I said, well, if I won the lottery, depending on how much it is, I would probably not come to work the next day. I would probably start a animal sanctuary and surf in Costa Rica. Again, it goes back to subjectiveness. You know, what a person does with winning the lottery, it doesn't tell us necessarily how they're going to perform in your role. It doesn't tell you much about, I mean, it might tell you a little bit about their values. Quality of life might be a value for them, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to be successful. People will work really hard for you, even if quality of life is, is really a work-life balance is still one of their values. If they won $500 million in the lottery, chances are some people may not come to work the next day. Another one is how would you conduct a business analysis for a potential customer? This one's a little bit more business oriented and some of you might have used something similar. The problem with this one is not necessarily the topic, it's hypothetical. It's you're asking somebody how they would approach a situation. What you're not asking them is how they have approached a the situation. They're telling you what you want to hear. They're, they're basically telling you what they think you want to hear, as opposed to examples of things and times they've actually done that. So a better way of doing that is just bring it to a behavioral say, hey, walk me through an example of a time that you had a customer and you had to really conduct a business analysis on their, on, on their organization. So those are some questions also you want to avoid. The way you want to source a candidate's ability, it goes back to what I said earlier, past behavior predicts future behavior. The things that a candidate has done are the things that a candidate will likely do in the future. So you're looking for them to answer with the situation, task, action, and result. So let's look at some examples. Here's an interview guide, a sample interview guide. So you see on the left, you, sometimes these are called indicator statements. Um, they can be called uh, key indicators, examples, whatever. But the, the competency at the top is achieves results. So the skill or the characteristic that this um, guy is looking for is does a candidate achieve results? Again, taking the subjectivity out of it, we def have to define it in our interview guide because Otherwise, what I believe achieving results is could be completely different than what you believe achieving results is. So we make sure that we've identified what exactly we're looking for. So on the left, they can handle multiple projects. They set um, goals. They have a specific plan on meeting them. They show persistence in overcoming obstacles and they ensure follow through to the desired results. And then after you crafted your indicator statements or your, your key indicators, then you build your questions that will help you get that data. So tell me about a time when you had conflicting priorities at work or share an example of when you had an important project with a tight deadline. Those questions will source the data you're looking for to support whether or not the candidate has demonstrated these indicator statements in the past. But your candidate is not always going to answer the way you'd like them to answer. Sometimes they're going to give you a false response, an incomplete response. 
And sometimes they'll give you the complete response and you'll go back after the fact and say, well, that was complete, but not really all the information I needed. So let's look at it. So the question is, share an example of when you had an important project with a tight deadline. I usually prioritize everything I need to accomplish. And then I block my calendar for ample time throughout the week to ensure I can accomplish it. Well, the, an the answer to this problem is, is in red, usually. This isn't a real example. Now, someone says, well, why is this, can't it be deceptive? Well, sometimes they just don't know. And that's why it's important you set the stage early and say, I want you to answer in specifics with star format and you still may need to prompt them. So in this situation, I would just simply go, hey, let me stop you there the second I hear the usually. Again, trying to interrupt to make the best use of our time. I heard you say usually, look, stop, I want to stop you. I'm looking for a specific time. So can you think of a specific time when you had to do this? Sometimes a candidate just doesn't know any better. Maybe they've never been um, on a behavioral-based interview. This is common um, more so when, when candidates are getting right out of college. You might be the first, second, or third interview after they've gone out of college uh, and they've graduated and they don't know what, what to expect. Same, another word you want to listen for is would. I would make a list of all the requirements for the project, then assess what I can currently push out of my current calendar. Again, don't necessarily think that this candidate is trying to be deceptive or, or trying to sell you. They may just not know better. So again, prompt them, say, hey, I heard you say you would do this. That's great, I love listening more about your thought process, but what I'm really looking for is a, you know, a specific time that you can think of. Now, I mentioned uh, candidates that are just getting out of college. It's possible that they don't have a lot of work experience. You can, sit, you can always just restructure the question. Say, this doesn't have to be at work. Is there a time where even in college or, or a, a job while you're in school that you had to do this. So again, you just want to be able to make sure you're getting real examples. So listening for things like usually would uh, think is a common one, making sure that you have really strong listening skills so that you don't end up after the interview, looking back at your notes and saying, wow, I don't have what I need. Incomplete. This is another common uh, issue. Share an example of when you had an important project with a tight deadline. My boss asked me to complete a budget update presentation last week, and I only had three days to finish it. I looked over my current week and assessed what I could move to ensure I had ample time to complete the presentation. Well, this is a real example, but what's missing? No results. So what happened as a result? So you, you um, I know the situation, you're asked to do a presentation, uh, I know you prioritize your calendar. What happened as a result? How did the presentation go? Did you complete it? You want to get as more as much information about what the result was because how they went about it is just as important as as what they you know what the outcome was. The, these are the two most. The situation is important for context. Unfortunately, many candidates spend so much time in the situation that they don't give as much detail on the more important factors of their actions and their results. So always be listening, did I get a result? And did I get an adequate result for what I'm looking for? Don't hesitate to ask follow-up questions. Here's another one. Share an example of when you had an important project with a tight deadline. When my boss asked me to complete a budget update presentation last week, I only had three days to finish. I looked over my current week. I assessed what I could do to move, uh, could move to ensure I had ample time to complete the presentation. I was able to finish the presentation and I delivered it on time. This is a complete star. And essentially you could say, well, they gave me a full star, but only you know, based on the, the indicators, is this enough information for me to make a judgment call on whether this person has the, the ability to do the job? I might follow up and say, how did the presentation go? How do you know? What was the feedback you received on your presentation from your boss? What did they say about it? When exactly did you get it done? So don't, again, don't hesitate to continue to ask follow-up questions. The more data that you receive, the better and more effective your decision can be. So now you've got data 
on how to, you, you've opened the interview, you've got your interview data. You know, typically speaking, you want to get about two to three examples, full examples for each competency you're hiring for. So if the role has four or five competencies and you need two or three examples, you may be asking throughout 10, 15, 20 interview questions. So that's why it's really important that you manage your time effectively and also assign different competencies and questions to um, your hiring panel, your, your other interviewers. Okay, so now you move into closing the interview and you wanna make sure you leave ample time here as well because at this time, you wanna allow the candidate the opportunity to ask questions. They wanna be heard, they want their questions answered. So allow the candidate to say, open up and say, hey, listen, I'm done with this portion of the interview. I've asked the questions that I had to ask. I wanna give you an opportunity to ask any questions you might have about the role, about the organization, or about myself. And I'll do my best to answer um, as well as I can. Setting expectations for next steps really goes to what we talked about earlier about candid experience. You want to be careful what you say. You don't want to guarantee somebody something. Like if you say, hey, I really loved your interview. I'm, re- I, I, I'm, I'm feeling good about moving you on, but I need to uh, connect with the other interviewers. And, what, and then they don't get it the second interview or next interview or, or, or offer. You might have overpromised. Um, but what you can say is, here's the next step in the process. The next step in the process is another interview. The next step pro- process is you'll hear from the recruiter. And the time frame in which that will happen is this. Just don't be the, don't be the interviewer that's, that doesn't assure, ensure that the, the candidate hears something. Even if they hear from the recruiter or yourself, like, hey, we've gone with another candidate or we felt that you weren't a fit at this time, Making sure that you, you honor their expect, these expectations that you set forth is really important. This is your last chance to get the data you need. So go through your notes one last time and make sure that you have all the data you need for the star questions. So if you realize that they didn't give me an action here or I want more on the situation or I need more concrete results, Now's your chance to say, hey, before we move on, I just want to circle back. I'd ask you this one question. Can you just clarify a little bit about what you specifically did in that situation? Or I'd love to learn a little bit more about what the results were. So making sure that this is your chance, making sure you get the data that you need to make the decision after the fact. And thank them. You know, they've taken their time to meet with you. It's, you want to be respectful. And it goes back to candidate experience. Say, Hey, listen, I just want to thank you for taking the time to come and interview with me and interview with the organization. Uh, I appreciate you doing that. Um, like I said, here's the expectations moving forward and uh, I'll walk you out or, or so-and-so walk out. But making sure that you acknowledge that they've made an investment in you and your organization, regardless of whether or not you want to move forward. It is always about treating that candidate with respect and dignity, regardless of your decision. Okay, I'm gonna move into how do you assess your data? You've done all this hard work. You've asked good questions. You've assessed, uh, you know, you've looked at whether or not they're a fit. You've looked at the skills and their examples, but a lot of times this is where the mistake happens during the debrief meeting. Now you go and you talk to the other interviewer and you say, "Uh, what did you think? And I say, I really like that person. Okay, I like them too. You just threw out all your work. It's all gone because you just went and defaulted into feelings. Or you said, I got to go to, you know, I think this person will be successful. I felt good about their interview. Why? So when you're having a debrief and you're talking to other, if you're just doing the assessment on yourself, uh, yourself solely, that's fine. Then I'm going to show you the process. But even when you're talking to somebody in debriefing and you're comparing notes, you still follow this process so that you stay objective in your decision. When you look through their star responses, you're going to really look at three things, relevant, recent, and impact. Relevant. Did they give you an example that's relevant to the competency and the role you're interviewing for? So if I'm interviewing for, um, <laughs> if I'm interviewing for a librarian position, I might be looking for planning and organizing and then the candidate gives me this response about, you know, influence on how they sold a deal. Like, that's not relevant, perhaps. You're making sure that the answers are relevant 
to the competencies and those indicators we discussed. Comparing, saying, yeah, that, that would be similar to what they would do every day. Recent. Why is it important to look at recency? Well, you're looking for somebody that has consistently demonstrated that skill. Is this something that if they prove, if they pull an example from 10 years ago or 20 years ago, well, do they still have that ability? Typically speaking, they say you want to look at examples within the last three years, maybe five years. But I typically say within the last, yeah, I say about that, like last job or two, um, you don't want to look for stuff that if all their examples are 10 years ago or greater, that's a red flag to me. It's because that's saying like, maybe they're not demonstrating, maybe they felt some bad habits or maybe they're not um, as, as skilled as they, they used to be. Who knows? But I want to make sure that their, their, their examples are recent. Last but not least is impact. Just because they gave you a complete star doesn't mean the results had, were really effective. You know, you could hear an example of, of, you know, let's just say that you're sourcing for somebody to sell enterprise, like big organizations, big deals, like working with like a big national or multinational organization or doing customer service at that level where you're, where this person must work with um, large organizations with many uh, stakeholders and all of their examples are really more of small businesses um, with three to five employees, that's probably not the, the same level of impact as you might need for the role. So again, looking at these three, these three um, factors will help you really assess the responses. Once you've assessed and you, and you take the responses, so if you're looking at like the, the competency we looked at earlier in, in the program was achieve results. So if you look at the two to three responses you got and then you compare notes with the other interviewer and, and you put it all together, you're going to look, want to rate the data. And then you look at, you look at it this way, you know, different, there's different rating systems. This was pulled from SHRM, Society for Human Resource Management, one of their resources. So it's just an example, but you'll see that the rating scale, some people use a one through five. Some people use different um, words. According to this rating scale, you're looking at the most important thing you want to see is, is does this person with their examples meet requirements of that competency? So do they demonstrate that competency accurately and consistently? That means I've, I've got a few examples throughout the interview that they were able to do these things that I've asked. They've, they've, done, these, they've done these things in their work previously and, you know, they had good examples. They didn't require a lot of supervision. It's good. Uh, I feel like this is, they met requirements. They're not perfect, but they met requirements. And maybe they meet requirements for what I would expect of a new hire. Do they exceed requirements so that, so that they, they demonstrated they had many good examples. They very accurately, consistently did this, this competency or skill without much guidance at all from their manager. They're, they really, really perform at a high level. Or are they below requirements? So this could be... Um, they gave me one example or they struggled to give me examples. Um, I kept asking them, say, Hey, can you tell me a real example? Can you tell me another example? Or um, can you give me a little bit more about what you did in that situation? That's why it's really important with the follow-up questions or can you um, tell me more about the results? That's if they, if they're, if you're constantly having to prompt them, then it's probably below the requirements of what you're looking for. And the bottom factor is significant gap. They're just not giving you the, the answers. Like they couldn't, they struggle to give up with any, give any good examples. So if we go back to achieves results and they didn't have really any good examples of when they went above and beyond and accomplished goals or they weren't able to handle multiple projects and chances are it's not a good fit. I, I saved the, the best for last, far exceeds requirements. And I'll tell you why. This is somebody their answers were just beautiful. Their answers were perfect. I mean, these answers are everything I could potentially look for. And there are a lot, a lot of good examples. Now, this is this sounds like the dream candidate. And it might be. But the one thing you as an interviewer have to ask yourself and, and also talk to your fellow interviewers if you're using an a interview panel, is this person overqualified? If all their examples are far exceeding the requirements of the job, 
across all the, all the, all the competencies or skills, are they going to get bored? Are they just taking this job as a filler? So you got to be careful of the, the overqualified candidate. If they're really blowing you away in the interview, like they're so good. They may be the one that retire, resigns in 30 days. They may be the one that we talked about in the 18 months where they leave the organization. They fail because they weren't, their heart wasn't in it because they were spending the whole time looking for their dream job while they were collecting a paycheck. So once you've analyzed each competency and you'll rate each uh, ability or, or skill or competency, however you want to phrase it, did they meet requirements? Did they exceed requirements? And then you compare your notes. And when you compare your notes with the other interviewers, it goes exactly like this. For achieves results, I got two examples. And based on the examples I got, I rated them on meets requirements. And this is why. And then the, inter- the other interviewer, if there is one, will say the same thing. Like, hey, this is what I got for examples. And this is what I rated them. And you have a discussion. You try to not default back to, I really like them. I felt good about their answers. No, did it meet requirements? Did it exceed requirements? Going back to, you know, objective data is the key to evaluating a candidate. Okay. So we're coming up on the end of our program here. And I just want to highlight some other best practices of of things that I've seen that really help you be successful as you interview and hire for retention. First, You've got to minimize distractions. You know, you could be working in a very busy office. Maybe you're even in a cube, um, making sure that you've uh, identified an area to interview that's not going to have distractions. You've set expectations for your team or your coworkers that from this time to this time, please do not disturb me. I will be in an interview. Uh, I need, you know, to, to just have that time dedicated to the candidate. Um, make sure you don't have your laptop open. Um, some people like to take notes on their laptop, but the problem with that is now your emails are coming in. Or for those of you that have like a corporate instant messenger, um, some have Skype or um, I forget some of the other ones, you're, you're getting notifications of messages coming in. Every time that happens, your listening skills went from level two to three up to level one. You're just barely listening. You're, you're it's just going in or one out, out the other. And that's going to really minimize your chances to make an effective decision. Watch time, the time commitment. I said this earlier. When you tell somebody that it's going to be a 60 minute interview and you already have the information you need and that they're not a good fit and you're itching to cut it short. Well, they're, they're thinking like that all goes back to candidate experience. The other thing is, it also potentially puts you in legal hot water because did you, did you only go 15 minutes in an interview? Candidates can be wondering why they got disqualified in 15 minutes. That's why it's really important for all decisions to be made on sound data. Um, <clears throat> many companies have a guidance of like 30 to 45 minutes uh, minimum. I personally think 45 to 60 is a sound bet because then you'll have the opportunity. I mean, if you're asking those behavioral based questions and you're asking resume questions and you're allowing the candidate to ask questions, there's no reason why an interview shouldn't be 30 to 45 minutes minimum, but 45 to 60 is more likely. The other thing is if, even if you're not getting the answers that you want, ask more questions because that will be objective data that you can fall back on. Should you um, have to, you know, handle a legal situation saying, this is why that candidate was not, uh, extend an offer because they answered this, this, and this on the competencies that we were looking for. It, you know, remember that, you know, you want to have a, a fair, unbiased process, um, both for the candidate, for yourself, your organization, but also to protect yourself legally. Another best practice um, in all the interviews uh, training I've done, I always laugh because the last thing, I'll either observe an interview live with real candidates or maybe a mock interview to see how the the participants are doing. And time and time again, I look at their notes afterwards and I say, how did, how did your notes look? And many people that are new to interviewing will, it'll look like chicken scratch. Either they'll have um, no notes, a few notes, maybe a doodle in the corner, maybe some words that they can't understand. So find a way that you can make sure that you take effective notes. 
because that's the only way you're going to make a, a, a decision that's based on the objective data. One best practice, if you have the ability, if you work in an organization with, with other employees, find a partner. So do two-person two interviewing where one person asks the question, the other person's responsible for listening and taking notes. That's a way that you can uh, ensure that you have a, a better chance of having really good, thorough notes. So I'll, I'll usually work with someone and say, hey, on this, um, on this interview, I'm going to interview for these competencies, these ability factors. When I ask the question, you take notes. And when you ask a question, I'll take notes. This is where we make sure that we capture everything. That is absolutely a best practice. I would highly recommend that. Uh, don't, for, don't be afraid to interrupt. If you set the stage early, um, just do it. it. It's one of the things that I, I, I see a lot of um, interviewers struggle with. But remember, this is, this is you want to make the best use of your time in there. So if, if you have all the information you need about a situation or a story, just kindly, just use empathy. Say, hey, I would love to learn more about, I have everything I need about that. Well, what I really want to focus on is, is it's really how you interrupt. It is, is, do you have empathy? Do you, are you being considerate when you're interrupting? Are you explaining the benefit to them? So don't hesitate to interrupt. You want to make sure that you, you don't want to go through that 17 minutes like I shared earlier. And then you find out you don't, you didn't ask any good questions. And last but not least, remember the candidate experience. Even if this candidate is not a good fit, treat them with respect, treat them with dignity because, you know, even I've seen on, on Glassdoor, or I've seen on company reviews, I've seen on message boards, even when candidates didn't get the job, but they, they were treated properly, they'll go and sometimes leave a message. Yeah, I, the, the process was fair or, or you never know if they come back. You may have a candidate that perhaps is not right today, but you give them some good feedback and you say, hey, listen, you know, I hope this is a fair process. Or maybe your recruiter handles this. Hey, this is why you didn't get the job. Here are some things to do and, and should you apply again? And then you could have a rock star or, or high performing superstar that may come back because they had a good experience and maybe they got the skills and the experience that they needed that would be a better fit for your role. So in closing, I want to thank you all for your time. I hope this was beneficial as we discussed some of the impact of, of your hiring decisions. We've, did, we've also provided a, a um, sound, objective process for ensuring you bring in the right talent to your organization and then some best practices. Again, uh, I'm the founder of Starling North LLC. We're a consultant organization. If you want more information on uh, anything we do, as well as any help with your interview process, you can uh, contact us at info at starlingnorth.com. Thanks again for your time. Have a great day. Friends, if you like this episode of the LeadX Leadership Podcast, please take a minute, leave a rating on iTunes or Stitcher. Ratings are invaluable for attracting new listeners. And I like to convert those listeners into leaders because you know I'm on a mission to spark 100 million leaders in the next 10 years. And if you want to become the boss everyone fights to work for and nobody wants to leave, check out the LeadX platform with Coach Amanda at leadx.org. And if you have 10 or more managers who could use some binge-worthy training, send me an email at info at leadx.org, L-E-A-D-X dot O-R-G, and we'll talk about getting you set up with a totally free pilot for those managers. See if they like it. If they don't, that's fine. We go away. Part as friends. But if they love it, you've just found yourself a new resource for them. Remember, leadership is influence. You're always leading.